AP Biology, Chapter 43, The Immune System, Part 1. In this chapter, we're going to learn about how the body defends itself against invaders. So why do we have an immune system? Well, we have uh, two ways we can get attacked, from outside and from inside. From the outside, there's lots of organisms that find you delicious. They have enzymes to break down your tissues. They can use that um, material for their own cell respiration, as well as for building up more bacteria or fungus or whatever it is that's trying to eat you. Animals must defend themselves against unwelcome invaders. Some of them are microscopic viruses, which are not considered alive, that we're going to talk about soon, bacteria, the simplest form of life, proteins, and fungi. We're a tasty vitamin-packed meal. We have no cell walls, so it's easier to get at our cells. And um, the reason why is because we've traded our mobility, our ability to move to different locations and find food. Uh, but as a result, we're more susceptible to disease than things like trees. And we have attacks uh, on the inside. We also have abnormal body cells that may result from mutations that could become cancerous, and your immune system can uh, attack those precancerous or cancerous cells. So our virus is alive. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about viruses now. They are not made up of cells. They don't have any uh, organelles whatsoever inside. They uh, reproduce only on the inside of your cells. When they're outside the cells of the thing that you're infecting, they are completely inert, no more active than, say, the pencil on your desk. They do have the universal genetic code of DNA or RNA, and when they're inside the cells, they do grow and develop. However, outside the cells, they don't do anything. They cannot obtain their own materials and ener energy. They have to get it directly from the cell that obtained it. They don't respond to their environment at all. Cells respond. Viruses don't. They cannot maintain a stable internal environment. They have no enzymes inside that are actively regulating by negative feedback or other means the internal environment but they are able to change over time very, very quickly. In fact, if we had to compare all the living things compared to viruses, viruses change over time faster than anything alive. All right, so here's some uh, different shapes of viruses. Just kind of want to point this out. So uh, for this previous slide, make sure that you understand that viruses are not considered alive, and the reason why is because they're not made of cells. And for some of these things, they only reproduce and uh, grow and develop inside the cell and they don't obtain materials and energy, respond to their environment, or maintain a stable internal environment. So you should be familiar with some of the reasons why we don't consider viruses alive. Though it's not an easy classification because you know, they do share some characteristics that we do. All right, so we have some diversity of viral shapes. This is called a T4 bacteriophage. This is a virus that likes to uh, infect bacteria. Basically, all viruses are very simple. They have a protein coat represented in green that's called a capsid. This part here is called a capsid. And then inside is either DNA or RNA, and that's pretty much it for a virus. Now, sometimes they have a few enzymes in there, but uh, they're not actively doing anything until there's an infection. Here we have the tobacco mosaic virus. This is another type of virus. Again, it's just got a capsid made of proteins and RNA uh, on the inside, and this one infects tobacco plants. And then we have the flu virus, also called influenza. They have a capsid, they have RNA, and they also steal a piece of your membrane, so it makes it a very difficult for this, uh, when they burst open your cells and cause infection, making it very difficult for your immune system to find it. Between 10 and 100 million people were killed by the flu virus about 100 years ago in 1917. All right, so just to give you an approximate size, uh, a scale, we're talking about really small stuff. Eukaryotic cells are about 10 to 100 times bigger than prokaryotic cells, bacteria. So proteins, fungi, plants, and animals, all eukaryotic, have the biggest cells. They have a lot of extra organelles inside. Bacteria are smaller. They only have uh, ribosomes inside as their uh, primary organelle for making proteins. But look at viruses. Viruses are very tiny, even compared to bacteria. All right, here's some information you should know, and we're going to talk about it now. We have the lytic versus lysogenic infections for viruses. And the basics that you have to know about this is lysogenic virus does not cause disease. It hides in your chromosomes write that down. Lysogenic virus DNA hides in your chromosomes and does not cause disease. Remember, you can uh, back it up anytime you need to. Okay, for the lytic part of the infection, lytic means it actually destroys the cell. The lytic part of a virus life cycle 
is when it makes copies of itself using up the materials inside the cell, destroys the cell, and then the viruses are able to move on to other cells. So that's an overview. Lysogenic chromosomes, uh, the DNA of the virus becomes part of the DNA of the, uh, the host. Lytic, actively engaged in destroying the cell, using up all the materials, and uh, making more viruses. All right, so let's go into a little more details here. Uh, let's say you get the flu and the flu virus attaches to your cells. Now, this is not one of your cells. You can tell it has a bacterial circle-shaped chromosome, but we're just kind of using that as an example. The virus RNA or DNA um, is injected inside the cell. If it's RNA, it's going to have to be converted to DNA by something called reverse transcription. Then the virus, if it's in the lytic cycle, and things like Ebola and the flu and uh, the viruses that cause disease immediately are always lytic, well, turn off chemically all the cell machinery inside the cell to make bacterial proteins, or in our case, human proteins, and force the cell to just make proteins for the virus and DNA or RNA for the virus. So that's basically what they're doing. And sometimes we use the analogy of a pirate ship for um, viruses. Basically, in a pirate situation, the pirates jump on board a uh, vessel, they're taken over, they loot everything, they take all the available stuff, and then they sink the ship, move on to another ship. And this is kind of what viruses do. They enter your cells, pretend that's the ship they're invading, they're the pirates. They use up everything inside the cell to make more uh, copies of themselves, more viruses, and then they kill the cell, and each one of those viruses are free to infect new cells. That's the lytic part of the virus uh, cycle. Really shouldn't call it a life cycle because they're not alive. Now in the lysogenic, things like uh, herpes will spend their time in the lysogenic cycle mainly and only occasionally cause sores in the lytic. So let's talk about that. Now the virus can become part of the chromosome. So what ends up happening, and this is the reason why we, you know, one of the reasons why we have no cures to these guys is because once they're physically part of your chromosome, how do you get rid of it? So the um, virus DNA, once it's part of your chromosome, is called something uh, called a prophage. This is the viral DNA that's embedded within the DNA of the host organism. Now, this viral DNA is not doing anything. It's completely uh, dormant. It's, uh, you would have no idea that the person has a viral infection, let's say herpes, if the DNA is hidden within the chromosome. So when the cells divide, the DNA from the virus gets divided also. It's kind of like tricking the uh, cell into making more copies of the viral DNA. So imagine if you had something like herpes and for years you're making copies of your cells, you're also making copies of that viral DNA as well. Now occasionally that, um, and there's things that trigger it like stress and heat and other things for herpes, it comes out of the uh, chromosome, the viral DNA, and then it goes into the lytic cycle where it actively causes uh, disease. So you should know that A, lytic cycle kills the cell, lysogenic just makes copies uh, when the cell makes copies, and second you should know that most viruses have like a combination of the two. However, some things like herpes is mainly lysogenic, some things like the flu virus uh, is mainly lytic. All right, take a minute to review this and let's move on. All right, so this is a good table to copy down. However, this is a lot of information, so uh, if you know it already, then that's good. Uh, but let me just point out some important things here. What we have is uh, reproduction. Remember, viruses uh, are not going to be active unless they're actively inside the host cell making copies. So if they're not in a host cell, they are completely um, dormant and uh, like in suspended animation, really. They're just a, a piece of, a, a, it's a molecule, basically, just sitting there. Genetic code, just like cells, they both have uh, DNA. Uh, some viruses have just RNA, called the retrovirus. Growth and development, no. Obtain and use materials and energy. Respond to the environment, no. Change over time, yes. Now here's the bottom part here, and you should know this. Uh, viruses can be prevented. There is no cure to any virus. Your body fights it or you don't. If you get a cold or a flu, if you take flu medicine, it doesn't help you fight the virus. All it does is suppress the symptoms so you feel better until your body can do the fighting. For um, bacterial infections, antibiotics can cure anti uh, bacterial infections. So remember that. Bacteria, things like E. coli or staphylococcus, strep throat, can be cured by antibiotics. Viruses, on the other hand, cannot be cured. They can only be prevented with vaccines. And we're going to see these two videos in class. All right, here's some uh, viruses. Here we have Ebola. You basically, uh, your uh, 
blood vessels break down, you start to bleed from every hole in your body. It's uh, typically lethal, and it's very dangerous. It's not here in the United States. It's only in Africa. These are cancer uh, caused, called Carposi sarcoma caused by HIV infection. And uh, remember that DNA is uh, going to be mutated by viruses, and sometimes the mutations lead to cancer. Here we have herpes in the mouth. That was more appropriate than other pictures I found on the internet. And um, this is the lytic part of the herpes uh, cycle. Here we have the flu virus, cold virus. They're both viruses. They're called uh, rhinoviruses. Rhino means nose. And here's smallpox. Smallpox is something that we don't have to worry about in the United States anymore, However, um, because we have vaccines. However, this was a very deadly uh, virus back uh, about 100 years ago. Also, there's another one called polio that affects the nervous system that we uh, also have vaccines to. So keep in mind, smallpox, polio, those diseases are not with us anymore uh, for the most part because of vaccines. And we'll talk about how those work later. A bacteriophage is just a virus that infects the bacteria. That's all I want to say with that. It looks like a little moon lander. All right, here's some bacteria that cause disease. Here we have the... Um, uh, tetanus. Sometimes you find it, uh, bacteria on rusty nails. And this bacteria, once it gets into your body, causes all your muscles to uh, contract at the same time. This is also called lockjaw because when your muscles contract, uh, it locks up your jaw. And it's very, very painful to have tetanus. So that's why you get a tetanus shot when you get punctured by a rusty nail. Over here we have uh, topical uh, anthrax. Uh, and anthrax is uh, is trying to be used as a biological weapon by uh, terrorists and things like that. Unfortunately for them, they can't uh, figure out a way to disperse it uh, effectively. However, uh, one thing about anthrax is that it forms a spore, so it remains active for decades. Uh, and that's one reason why they're trying to use it. Remember, bacteria we have cures to antibiotics. However, they're evolving. The bacteria, as they evolve to fight our antibiotics, our antibiotics become less effective, and we have to make new ones. Here we have botulism. If you ever see puffed out cans, that might be the gases produced by botulism. And uh, this one's a really deadly one, too. And uh, it basically uh, shuts down your nervous system and relaxes your muscles until you just can't breathe. It's estimated that a teaspoon of the toxin produced by the botulism, the botulism itself doesn't uh, kill you, but the toxin it produces does, um, properly distributed could kill every person on this planet. So that's another one that's kind of uh, worrisome. Avoid those puffed out cans at the store. However, if you do it enough, you make something called Botox. And Botox is used to uh, uh, relax the muscles in your temple. And uh, a lot of people get that treatment. Over here, we have something that killed about a third of the Europeans in the Dark Ages called bubonic plague, or Yersinia pestis. The plague bacteria lives in the um, flea. The flea lives on rats. And in medieval times, in Dark Ages times, the fleas jumped off the rats, bit people, and they got plague. And no one was able to figure that out. We have plague here in Colorado. However, um, we have antibiotics, so we don't really worry about it too much. Groundhogs carry the, uh, or prairie dogs, rather, carry the uh, plague. All right, here's some protease diseases that we have to defend ourselves again, uh, against. We have malaria caused by a uh, protease called plasmodium. These are difficult to treat because they're eukaryotic, just like us. Things that kill them kill us too. So we don't have very good effective treatments against uh, malaria. Amoebic dysentery, amoebas live in your large intestine. They irritate it. You have a lot of diarrhea. And then the loss of water from diarrhea is what's usually uh, fatal. If you drink enough water, you can prevent that. We have something called giardia, which is similar to amoebic dysentery as far as its effects, which also cause diarrhea. So don't drink that water that you think is clean. Purify it first. Then we're here we have African uh, sleeping sickness caused by this little guy called trypanosoma. Lives in the tsetse fly. Tsetse fly bites you, gets trypanosoma in you, and then you have African sleeping sickness, which can be lethal. These are protease diseases that we don't have good cures to. Here we have uh, how malaria works. Basically, there's a little backwash the mosquito gives you, and in that backwash, when it injects you with anticoagulant to keep the blood flowing, they give you some of these uh, plasmodium. They multiply in the liver, and then they infect your red blood cells. And then uh, another mosquito bites you, sucks up some of that plasmodium, and infects someone else. Now, since um, mosquitoes are the vector, a vector is something that carries disease, we try to control the vector, the mosquito, to control plasmodium since we don't have effective weapons against that. And here's some fungal diseases. 
Um, and we have some topical antifungal treatments like tough actin, tenactin, but once they get inside your body, they're more difficult to treat. Here we have athlete's foot. It's the same thing as jock itch, except jock itch is uh, uh, a little bit further north. Here we have ringworm, which is not a worm. It's just a, a circle that spreads and gets bigger and bigger underneath the skin as a fungal infection, and that's treatable. And things like uh, plants and fish also get fungal diseases from time to time. All right, this ends part one of your notes on chapter 43, the immune system.